and welcome. My name is Katie Wainwright. I'm a user experience researcher on a team called Products for All here at Google, whose mission is to make Google and Google products inclusive and accessible for everyone. And part of my work and my team's work has included helping teams across Google be more age inclusive so that everyone, regardless of age, can have a great user experience. And so I am thrilled to welcome Ashton Applewhite today who has a mission that deeply resonates with me and I am so very excited to hear more about. The author of This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. Ashton Applewhite is a leading spokesperson for the emerging movement to raise awareness on ageism and how to dismantle it. A co-founder of Old School Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse. She's been recognized by the New York Times, the New Yorker, National Public Radio and others as an expert on ageism. Ashton has written for Harper's and The Guardian and The New York Times. She has a blog over at This Chair Rocks and is the voice of, yo, is this ageist? She speak, she's spoken widely at venues all across the world, and so I'm very excited to have her here today to talk with us. First, we're going to hear from Ashton, who will share her thoughts and perspectives on age, aging, ageism and how to build a more age-inclusive world. And then we're gonna have a short moderated chat since I personally selfishly have lots of questions for her. And then we'll do a live Q and A at the end. So if you're tuning in on the audience, please add any questions that you have to the right side of your screen so that we can get to them at the end. And without further ado, please welcome Ashton Applewhite. Hi everyone, thank you for coming to this. I am excited to be speaking to you all. Um, and let's start where it hurts, uh, with the word old. How does that word make you feel? I used to feel the same way. My darkest fear was ending up in some grim institutional hallway. And then I learned that the, when I first learned it, the percentage of Americans over 65 in nursing homes was four and a half percent. Now it's under 2% and it's dropping. What else was I worried about? Dementia. But if you take out that percentage of people um, living in nursing homes over age 65, 90% of the remainder can think just fine. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease, but it's not typical of aging. And in fact, dementia rates are falling substantially. There are more cases because there's more older people as a percentage of the population, and age is the biggest risk factor. But the likelihood of anyone listening to me right now Getting dementia has gotten lower and lower, and people are being diagnosed at later ages. The real epidemic is anxiety over memory loss, and I'll talk about why that, about why that anxiety is bad for us. Another assumption was that old people were depressed because they were old and they were going to die soon. And then I learned that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. So all of you at midlife, if things look grim, they get better. It's called the U-shaped happiness curve, and it's been borne out by dozens of studies in the U.S. and around the world, and you don't have to be a Buddhist or a billionaire. That curve is a function of the way aging itself affects the brain. So I started feeling a whole lot better about getting older, and I started obsessing about why so few people know these things, because it's, it's data right at the top of the internet. The reason is ageism. Discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age is the narrow dictionary definition. We experience it anytime someone assumes that we are too old, air quotes around that because there's really no such thing, too old for something instead of finding out who we are and what we're good at and what we want to do, or too young. Ageism cuts both ways and younger people experience a lot of it too, as any of you had to, who had to work hard to get your, you know, your foot in the door in the job market. Ageism is any judgment about a person or a group of people based on how old we think they are. Prejudice is not about biology. It's about power. All forms of prejudice, ageism, sexism, racism, ableism, are socially constructed ideas, which is a fancy way of saying we make them up and we can unmake them. And these ideas change over time and they serve a social and economic purpose. Prejudice is not about who we are. It's about how we see ourselves, how others perceive us, and about how people in power assign meaning to those perceptions, right? And how the society ranks us in hierarchies of value. 
Stereotyping underlies all prejudice, the assumption that all members of a group are the same. And of course, stereotypes are always mis a mistake, but they are especially false, I guess, or inaccurate when it comes to age, because the longer we live, the more different from one another we become. And yet the, a common assumption is like everyone in a senior living joint is the same age, which would be old, when they can span four decades. Now, would you ever think that way about a group of people from age 10 to age 50? They are in fact more developmentally alike, right? Same about the people listening to me right now. The median age of a Google employee is 30. And y'all are far more like one another physically, socially, and developmentally than people between age 40 and 80. The longer we live, the less that number, that age that everyone always wants to know, the less that number says about us. Prejudice serves a really useful purpose, especially under capitalism. It pits us against each other. Pitting young against old, like pitting uh, work, uh, low wage workers against each other or stay at home moms against the interests of mothers in the paid workforce is a time honored tactic used to divide people who might otherwise join forces and change things, divide and conquer. This us or them logic always pops up around healthcare rationing. Listen for it. Why should we spend money on older people when we could spend it on kids? It's not ethical or legal to allocate resources by race or by sex and weighing the needs of the old against the young is equally unacceptable, period. And it also doesn't make sense to think in old versus young ways out in the real world. Families are made up of all ages, so are communities. Places that are good to grow old in, which means they have social services and public transport and benches and parks, they're good for everyone. They're all age friendly, right? It's not just good for sad old people. We are all ageist. No one is born biased, but attitudes start to form in early childhood around the same time that attitudes about race and gender start to form. And in this culture, negative messages about late life come at us from the media, popular culture, the radio, magazines, billboards at every turn, starting with Disney movies, right? Wrinkles are ugly. Old people are incompetent. It's sad to be old. And we olders can be the most ageist of all because we've had a lifetime of absorbing these messages. And unless we stop to challenge them, they become part of our identity. Identity That's internalized. Uh, bias, right? It's the same as true of internalized racism or internalized homophobia. I had to acknowledge my own prejudices and stop colluding. Like, just to take a, a, a random example, senior moment quips. I finally stopped making them when I remembered that in high school, I lost things all the time and I didn't blame it on, you know, I didn't call it a junior moment. Young people forget things all the time too. So what was the hardest prejudice to let go of? the one against myself, my future older self. All prejudice relies on what sociologists call othering, seeing a group of people as other than ourselves, whether it's other nationality, other religion, other sports team. The weird thing about ageism, because older people do bear the brunt of it, most of the stigma is about the older end of the spectrum, that other is us, our own older selves. Ageism is prejudice against our own future selves which of course makes no sense, but no prejudice makes sense. And ageism feeds on denial, our reluctance to acknowledge that we are aging, that we might even be old, right? Certainly older. And it is denial when we try to pass for younger or believe in what anti-aging products promise or get offended when someone politely offers us a seat on the bus. And this age denial not only blinds us to our own bias, right? We're busy keeping up the walls between our present self and our older self. It perpetuates it in a thousand ways. Aging is not the problem. The problem is discrimination. Just like it's not being women that makes life harder for women. It's sexism. It's not loving a man that makes life harder for gay guys. It's homophobia. And it is not the passage of time that makes getting older, especially in this culture, so much harder than it has to be. It is ageism. Now, I don't know if you've reached the stage where labels might be hard to read or you need a handrail. I am certainly there or I can't open the damn jar. 
And we tend to think like, it's my fault. I should be stronger. I should be fitter. I should be better prepared. Maybe even I should have stayed home. We tend to blame ourselves instead of blaming the ageism and ableism that makes these natural changes in our bodies shameful and the discrimination that makes these barriers acceptable. When we dye our hair just to cover the gray or leave early accomplishments off our resumes or lie about our age on a dating site, we reinforce age shame. These are really successful strategies. I completely understand why so many people engage in them, especially women, I'll get to that. And so no judgment, right? They are useful in this world. But these strategies aren't good for us because they're rooted in shame about something that shouldn't be shameful. And from a structural point of view, they give a pass to the discrimination that makes those behaviors useful. And for people who face other layers of discrimination, like queer people, people of color, the costs of these barriers are even higher. Aging is not a problem to be fixed or a disease to be cured. It is the one natural, lifelong, powerful process that unites every person on earth. You can't make money off satisfaction, but shame and fear create markets and capitalism always needs new markets, right? Who says wrinkles are ugly? The multi-billion dollar piece of the skincare, the anti-aging piece of the skincare massive beauty industry. And who says perimenopause or low T or mild cognitive impairment or medical problems? The trillion dollar pharmaceutical industry and what a market, right? Because sooner or later, everyone's gonna come down with some piece of, piece of this. The more clearly we see these forces at work, the easier it is to envision alternative, more positive and more accurate narratives. And the longer we wait, the more damage they do to ourselves individually and to our place in the world. Couple of examples, y'all are at work. Ageism cuts work lives short. Longer lives require working longer and saving more. And yet even in the face of a global labor shortage, four out of five American workers say they have seen or been the uh, experienced age discrimination or witnessed it, right? And age bias makes it harder for young people to get started, as I mentioned, but older people bear the brunt, especially in tech. Y'all know how ageist tech is. Um, age, I mean, I think tech and advertising won't take the cake. It takes us olders longer to find jobs if we're laid off. And if we're out of a job more than six months, which is often the kiss of death for job seekers, it's much harder to, um, to land a job at all. Often I can't tell you the stories I hear about people who send out hundreds of resumes finally get an interview, and it's over the minute they walk in the door or turn on their camera. White men faced all these barriers. They're higher for white women and even harder to surmount for everyone else. The personal and economic consequences are devastating. And I know, I know I'm going to get some questions from Katie about technology and older, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the Q&A. But it's really important to keep in mind that not a single stereotype about older workers is legit. There's no basis. And it's important for older people to keep an open mind about younger people. Your boss may be young enough to be your grandchild, but that doesn't mean she has nothing to teach you, right? We need to be open-minded. Shout out here for the Greglers, Google employees over age 40 in the ERG who are doing this work in your company. And to you, Katie, you all know that diverse workplaces aren't just better places to work. They work better. They result in higher creativity, hires more satisfied clients, and just like race and gender, age is a criterion for diversity, right? Obviously, the one thing you can do is in conversations around diversity, if age isn't part of the conversation, ask why not. If everyone's, I mean, I don't know about you, I notice now when everyone in the room is male, when everyone in the room is white. If everyone's the same age, ask why, you know, or suggest that you mix it up. Ageism harms our health. Ageism in, in medicine, I just read a shocking thing about how many uh, in um, emergency rooms across the country, there's very few people who know how to treat kids. That's ageism too, because kids don't vote and kids don't spend money. But most of the bias is directed against older people who often don't get as much treatment, often no treatment at all. Doctors tend to spend more time with younger patients, even though they have fewer health concerns. And, you know, why should we accept a different standard of care for older people? That 
is institutional ageism at work and internalized ageism matters to a lot. There's a studies coming out all the time adding to this fascinating body of evidence that connects attitudes towards aging to, to how our minds and bodies function at the cellular level. People with more positive feelings about aging, that's usually how the media puts it, but it's not that we shouldn't, we, you know, we, we need to not gloss over the scary stuff, which is real. But what that really means is a more accurate attitude towards aging. People who know some of the things I've just told you, those people walk faster, heal quicker, live longer. That's why the World Health Organization, not the World Old People Organization, launched a global campaign to combat ageism in the second year of the pandemic. They were a little busy that first year because they understood that the biggest obstacle to extending health span, the number of years we're all in relatively good health, along with lifespan, was age bias between our ears and in the world. Part of the health consequences are the effects of ageism on cognition. People who associate old age with growth and purpose, I love this study, are less likely to develop dementia, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. Most of the research comes out of Yale, done by a wonderful scholar named Becca Levy, and her latest published finding is a remarkable. Positive, more accurate age beliefs don't just help prevent mild cognitive decline, they can actually reverse it. Becca is a very careful scientist. She would not use the word reverse unless it was backed by science. They can reverse these, these more accurate age beliefs, can reverse cognitive decline and improve memory. Lots of factors shape the way we age, including class, geography, the churnings of the global economy. Most of these things we can't control. What's one thing we can control? Our attitudes. These accurate, more accurate, and positive understanding of aging, the thinking goes, help keep us healthy by buffering stress and prejudice, the effects of living in an ageist world. And when we equate aging with disease and decrepitude, on the other hand, that makes us more vulnerable to exactly what we fear. It's probably not news to any of you listening that ageism disproportionately affects women. We experience the double whammy of ageism and sexism, so we experience aging differently. There's a double standard at work here, shocker, the notion that aging enhances men up to a point and devalues women. And we women reinforce this double standard when we compete to stay young, right? The, you know, which is impossible and expensive. And when we do that, we reinforce ageism, sexism, lookism, the idea that appearance is the most important thing about us and patriarchy. You don't need a PhD in women's studies to figure out that this is not good for us. It pits us against each other, right? It sets us up to fail. You can't stay young. And it affects our income and our health and well-being. Women are more likely to end up poor in late life because we earn less than men. We're penalized for time we spend out of the paid workforce, typically doing unpaid caregiving. And we live longer. And the effects add up over time and are further compounded as always by race and class, which is why the poorest of the poor and sickest of the sick everywhere in the world are old women of color. Ageism segregates us. Discrimination of any sort sanctions segregation and isolation. And the biggest threat to a good old age is not, it's, it's not uh, good health, it's not running out of money, it's isolation. The most important thing you can have is a solid social network. Feeling alienated from older people like me and apprehensive at becoming like us is not natural. It's not inevitable. Age segregation impoverishes us all because it cuts us off from most of humanity, literally. Especially in the U.S. where very few people have significantly older or younger friends. And the opposite is, of course, true that age diversity enriches us, just like if we have friends of different races and friends from different places. It enriches us in countless intuitively and strategically obvious ways. So at this point in history, we have an extraordinary opportunity. For those of us with access to health care and education, which I think means, uh, you know, huge um, majority of people who are lucky enough to work at Google, for the first time in human history, four 
even five living generations are becoming commonplace. The, in the Paleolithic era, our homonym ancestors evolved to live long enough to, to have a third living generation. And that's when art happened. That's when civilization happened. So we are in evolutionarily new territory, right? Which is incredibly exciting. And the roles and institutions around us were created when lives were shorter and they have yet to catch up. This is new. So this gives us a critical window of opportunity to shape a world that supports people of all ages across the lifespan, right? It's not just about helping old people. To take advantage of this longevity dividend, right? That the human and social capital of millions more healthy, well-educated adults than ever before in human history. We need to quit the hand wringing that always crops up around anything to do with oldness, challenge the ageist and ableist assumptions that underlie that hand wringing and think about how to create, envision and create, which so many of you are doing that, you know, in the arena of technology and social relations. What do we want an age integrated society to look like, right? Because that's the one we all want to live long enough to inhabit. It's going to take all hands on deck and all ages. So how do we get there? A couple of suggestions. Tap into what we know. Aging enriches us. Growing older isn't just different from what we've been brainwashed to believe. It's way better. It's not that the losses aren't real. They are real. We need to acknowledge them. But aging also brings authenticity and confidence and perspective, especially for women, right? We care less about what people think, which is really liberating. We, our priorities are clearer. We get better at not sweating the small stuff. It's easier to manage emotions. We want less. That's why very few people actually want to go back to their youth. Anyone want to go back to their teenage years? You know, most older people don't want to go back to their middle age years either, right? Because we know no matter how apprehensive we may be, that our years are what make us us. Secondly, learn to look more generously at each other and at ourselves. Entire industries are built on convincing people that my 71-year-old face and body are hideous, that old equals ugly, especially for women. System designed to exploit our insecurities only works if we agree to it, though. This is not easy, but it is doable. Instead of muttering what the hell happened at the face in the mirror, how about taking a minute for the olders listening to me to think about all the things that did happen and how remarkable some of them were. Let's not delude ourselves. This is the work of a lifetime. We need to embark on it with others and with all ages, but none of this stigma is natural and none of it is fixed. We can take a page from the body acceptance movement. We can insist at any age on being seen and valued as our full, rich, lumpy, wrinkly, complicated selves and take that change out into the world. And when you walk out with that kind of self-awareness, people feel it. Really important one, ask for help. Ask for help when you need it. And we all need it all the time. In India, where most old people live with their families, there is nothing demeaning about receiving care and support of all kinds, including with toileting. Imagine that. The, perms, the terms and the, the power relations, they're going to shift, and sometimes in unwelcome ways. The gift is to learn to give and receive with grace, I love this quote from a Dutch uh, gerontologist named Jan Bars, autonomy requires collaborators. No one is independent ever. I'd like to take the word independent out of the whole dialogue around aging. We are social creatures. All of life is interdependence. And these are two-way, mutually gratifying transactions. No one likes to ask for help, but people love to give help. So what's that disparity about? So let's acknowledge the need that we're, you know, that we're going to need helping hands from birth to death and reach for them gratefully and without shame. Really important, make friends of all ages. As I mentioned, like the most important a component of a good old age. And I was so startled to learn this. I mean, I didn't know anything 20 years ago. I thought it must be health and then wealth. It's having a good solid a social network. And that is one reason it is so essential to make friends of all ages and hang on to them. Seek them out. Making a significantly older or younger friend is an anti-ageist act. Think of something you like to do. Concert going, playing poker, pickleball, whatever, you know, reading, reading group. 
and find a mixed age group to do it with or, or create a group and be intentional about people who are different from you in age and ideally other things as well. Don't stay home just because you'll stick out. That's how desegregation happens. People with the most at stake, older people in, you know, in, an, in a youth, youth oriented society, we step up, we step out, we stop conforming. And open-minded people welcome us and incremental social change takes place. And younger people benefit too, because otherwise each generation has to figure out on its own how dumb and destructive it is to fear growing older and how much of our youth we squander on worrying about it. And last but not least, join forces. Dismantling ageism is going to take nothing less than a mass movement like the 20th century women's movement that catalyzed this massive shift in voice and visibility for women around the world. We have made real progress and we've gotten a lot of pushback on rights for queer and trans people too. But the pushback is a sign we're getting somewhere because no one gives up power without a struggle. Culture change is slow, but it is real. Compare, I don't know how I could report to a woman 20 years ago to how could I report to someone younger today, right? This, these changes happen. Check out the old school anti-ageism clearinghouse, which Katie referenced, oldschool.info. It's a resource bank of hundreds of free vetted resources, talks, workshops, podcasts, everything's free except the books. I created that, it because uh, with two colleagues because movements need tools and ways to come together and share what we know. A global movement to end ageism is underway. And what's my evidence? Well, when we created, launched Old School in 2018, there was no campaign section. And now it's one of the fastest growing with 35 campaigns and counting designed not to help old people, you know, stay healthy or, you know, eat better, but about what ageism is, how it works, and how we can undo it. It happens to be a busy week in age land because October 1st was the UN's International Day of Older Persons. That's a thing. And Help Age International, which is this wonderful global organization, just launched uh, on Saturday a campaign called Older Not Over, which depicts people all around the world from Austria to Zimbabwe is their tagline. Emphasis on Zimbabwe and the majority world which is fantastic because the face of the movement is typically a face like mine, an older white woman, and that has to change. Everyone is aging. Everyone has a voice, deserves a voice in how we challenge it. You have two days to suit up for Ageism Awareness Day on October 7th, which started in Australia a couple of years ago and is now observed around the world. The movement is happening. A really important thing about dismantling ageism and that social movement is that it means supporting every struggle for equal rights. We can't get rid of ageism without addressing ableism in particular, right? Stigma around ability, disability, because so much of our fear about aging is apprehension about how our minds and bodies might change. That's not ageism, that's ableism. Plenty of younger people are disabled. Plenty of older people are not. So we have to address ableism and racism and sexism and all the rest, because these are systems of oppression that feed on, on and depend each other, right? That's the idea behind the theory of intersectionality developed by Kimberly Crenshaw and other black feminists. Age equity requires gender equity because aging is harder for women. Age equity requires disability equity because fears of incapacity feed stigma and age shame and age equity requires racial equity because racism denies multitudes the chance to age at all. In the words of poet and activist Audre Lorde, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives. And I, know, I don't know about you, that can feel overwhelming like the idea of these layers of oppression, but here's a different way to think about it, that Different forms of activism compound and reinforce each other too. When we ch confront any practice, any, any prejudice, any kind of bias, we chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlie them all. Aging is the one human experience. Ageism, the one form of bias everyone encounters. And when we make the world a better place to grow old in, we make it a better place in which to be from somewhere else, to have a disability, to be queer, non-white, non-rich, right? If you, are, if you are working to be anti-racist, you are making the world a better place for older people who are not white and so on. And when we show up at all ages for whatever cause we believe in, whatever matters, save the whales, the clinic, the democracy, 
we not only make that effort more effective for obvious reasons, we dismantle ageism in the process. Longevity is, longevity is here to stay. A movement to end ageism is underway. I'm in it, and I hope you will join me in it. There are lots of ways to do so. So Katie, back to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. That is um, such an important topic. Your passion so clearly comes through on this. Um, I have, gosh, so many notes uh, from all the things you just said. I have some questions that I want to dive into for a little bit, but I want to remind the audience that if you have any questions at all, please put them in the live chat on the right side of your screen so that we can get to them at the end. Um, I'm I really curious. Things you don't agree with or don't believe <laughs> No, I think a lot of this is things that I have been saying for the last several years across all of Google and uh, outside of it to say, hey, we need to do this, especially this concept of building for older adults makes things better for everyone, not Never just older nine. adults. Exactly. Yes. When we make things better for every group, and this is the same for disability inclusion, when we build for people with disabilities, Everybody has better experiences. And when it's universal, it loses its stigma. The stigma yeah. shouldn't be there, but it's one way to undo the stigma. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's such an interesting concept to think about stigma. When we hear people talk about their older adult loved ones, there's this concept that they are not interested in certain things like technology. They don't have the ability to learn anymore in the same way that they used to. And these are all really big myths that we need to bust, right? We, we do. I'm, yeah. I mean, it depends on the person. You know, I, some of the most tech averse people I know are younger people. You know, one of the most technically adept people I know is my partner who's uh, 77. You know, it depends on the person and it depends on what you, you know, we all, if we need to make a living, have a skill to, you know, to, to pay the rent, to support our kids, we learn that thing. I'm not particularly technophilic to say the least, but you know, I'm reasonably adept at social media because I need to for my work. We learn what we need to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a really interesting point that you brought up before where we have this assumption that everybody over 65 is one big group, but they, uh, ev the truth is that everybody has a lifetime of learning and liking different things and exploring different paths. And we're actually wildly different humans at that yeah, point. I mean, we and actually get more different from each yeah. other over time. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of reiterate for me again, what are the dangers of labeling people as just all one category at that age and just saying, you're over 65, you're an older adult, that's all we need to know? Well, it's the same, you know, it, it's analogous to, to uh, loop, you know, grouping people by race or saying all, you know, all queer people want this thing. It's, it's always wrong in, in um, one way it turns up a lot. I'm on, I have many uh, little crusades, one of which is to get people to use the word generation less. It's really common. Mm -hmm. But the minute we hear the word generation, there's no scientific basis for generation, except in the sense that my parents were one generation and my children are another. Other than that, there's no basis. It's like a bunch of people born sort of around the same time, but sometimes that's four years and sometimes that's 14. And the minute we hear generation and, and label a generation, all these assumptions, which are inherently ageist because the idea is that millions of people around the same age are the same, um, is patently impossible. And it, it covers over the way more important role that other factors, class in particular, ethnicity, gender, all play in shaping who we are, whether that person likes that idea or is good at that thing or wants to do that thing has much more to do with these other aspects of our identity. We're not aware of that. One reason that seems counterintuitive is because we spend so much time in same age silos. The more time you spend with queer people, the harder it is to be homophobic. The more you realize, like, I love some of them and some of them are jerks, right? It doesn't have to do with who they sleep with and so on. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I've actually never thought about the word generation in that context before and kind of the ways that it could be harmful. I think that one of the things that I notice when I talk to different teams about age inclusion is this concept that if we're building for older adults, that means we're building for baby boomers or we are building for a specific generation. And it's been a, a, a lot of reframing to talk about how if you build for older adults now, you're going to also build for your future self. And I think you started to touch on that concept of what are those internalized biases that we have and how do we deal with that and set ourselves up for success in the future? Well, you know, to, to educate yourself about age and aging, um, you know, 
uh, there's my book. Follow me on social media. There's, you know, a, a look at old school, old school info does it, hundreds of resources of all different kinds. You know, it's, it's free. And that is, is the most important thing we can do. I mean, when you say you're designing for old people, who does that even mean? First of all, where does age begin in tech? As you all know, it starts at about 28. I mean, you know, it's th this shit starts young, right? So it, is old people, everyone from 30 to 90? How could you possibly imagine that a single set of tech specs or a single yeah. color or a single size or shape or user, what's the word, user um, your requirements, um, could mm -hmm. possibly, it could possibly fit that market, which again, you know, is more heterogeneous over time. In the most important thing you can do is of course, involve older people on the team. There is a, you know, there's an assumption, and this is tricky, that designing for older people means designing things that are easy to use, um, that it, you know, but guess what? All this stuff should be easy to use. Good things should be well designed because, as you pointed out, something with a good UI that has a font that is either readable or easily enlargeable and so on is easy for everyone to use. It is by definition inclusive, right? And you know, but it is true that our senses function less well. I wear hearing aids. I used to be blind as a bat, but now that I've had double cataract surgery, my vision is better than it ever was. But, you know, it is true that we do need to think about products that take those things into consideration. But plenty of older people are not disabled, can see and hear just fine. So don't, when you make a product that is easy to use for someone who has visual or auditory difficulties, you are making it easier for everyone to use. There's no, I mean, I know it's harder. And I know it's more expensive, but it is important to do in a world of longer lives. It's important to do because it's ethical and it's important to do because you're all on Google. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I'm just going to replay that clip over and over to everybody that I talk to at uh, Google from now on. That's just, I mean, absolutely. That resonates so much. I think that there's this assumption that growing older implies disability. And yes, our bodies change. You but... know, I don't ever want to say, oh, no, no, no. But they're not equivalent. Yes. And we age at different rates. Some person, you know, cognitive decline is, you know, it's severe cognitive decline is relatively rare. You know, I couldn't, I mean, I had trouble understanding apps when I, you know, when they first invented the app, I figure out the ones I need to. It's not yeah. because of age. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I go around saying the same example of as a millennial, TikTok wasn't made for me. I have, I cannot, I've never successfully made a video on TikTok because I, the UI is confusing. It wasn't aimed at my generation. And so we continue to get stuck in the cycle where we're thinking about what's the hot new young group and we start ignoring everybody above a certain age. Yeah, which is, which is a huge, you know, group of, of humanity that I live in New York and um, the, they just, the, um, Department of Aging just initiated an anti-aging ageism curriculum in 10 Brooklyn high schools. And the Wall Street Journal wrote a story about it. And they interviewed one of the, a 14 year old who was in the program. And she said, you know, my, my kid sister and her friends are listening to songs that I don't know. And it makes me feel so old. So it, it's really important to let go of the idea that there is an age or a stage yeah. where X happens or why yeah. stops happening because it's not true and it's different for each of us and yes. things keep shifting. You know, the rate of technical change is accelerating, you know, so fast. We're all adapting to stuff all the time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Technology just moves so fast. And I think we have this conception because of all the things that you just mentioned that like, okay, if we say we need to create a world for older people or we need to create technology for older people, what we can do is like, take the take a product as is and just strip away literally everything and that way when we think about like you know our grandma who couldn't turn on the tv we think the solution is to make it so easy that anybody can do it and give her two buttons and that's it and just talk I push really loudly when you explain I, yes. it to her i mean I that's, a, that's a trope so easy grandma could do it which exactly. is so insulting I know it's so offensive to literally so many people that want to participate in the world and in technology yeah, as opposed to know, get treated like that. Is that older person, you know, a woman in rural Rwanda with, um, you know, just a flip phone and maybe spotty internet service? Is that person a, a, a health technician 
in, you know, in Zurich, I mean, they may be the same age, but they have different needs. Yes, absolutely. It's such a diverse group. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. So one of the things that you talked about was we talked about like generation and the language. And one of the interesting things that I heard you say is the word olders as a substitute (laughs) for saying older adults, which I also had never heard before. Um, And you had a really lovely anecdote about senior moments and stop using that language. And I think language is such an important piece of not only how we communicate, but how we frame our own thoughts and and create these biases. And um, there's even ones that are not necessarily just anti-aging like over the hill or senior moments but there's also ones that are so pro-youth like young at heart that has so many implications and so talk to me more about why that's harmful and and what do we do about this this concept of language um well you know language shapes culture culture shapes language again a plug for old school old school.info i don't make any money off it but if you searchable by topic and if you enter language you will see lots of examples of um, you know, of, of, of pro-aging or really age-neutral language. I don't want a world where older people are put on pedestals, right? I want a world where age is neutral because every human being, you know, deserves respect. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb to, you, you know, and this has to do with, with gender and, um, you know, people's um, official titles. Ask people what they want to be called and use that. I invented olders and youngers because I, when I was writing my book, I literally got tired of typing older people or older (laughs) adults and older adults is just clunky. And I started using olders and youngers. And I I will tell you, and I know I have a couple of friends on the call who are listening that people who know me well have started to use them because it's always, because it emphasizes that we age in relation to others where everyone's on this, you know, terrified of when does old begin? And am I on the wrong side of the velvet rope at which point, you know, everything goes to hell. There's no velvet rope. There's no point, you know, I, I might lose a facility that I don't miss. I serve sucks. I never played tennis. You know, I have arthritis in my shoulder. It would be terrible if tennis was really important to me, right? It depends. So if you just talk about older and younger people, it's always accurate and it's inclusive instead of saying, um, you know, that generation or this generation or people over 65 or people over 40. I mean, age demarcations are useful, but unless they have to do with, you know, the fire department, um, you know, people with jobs that require strenuous physical activity, mm-hmm. which we lose capacity for. That, that is the, you know, we, we, we do slow. Our bodies work less well. That is universal. Um, you know, but other than that, thanks to technology, most jobs don't require strenuous physical effort. Look at what the person, you know, person has and try not to make age a criterion for it or a disqualifier. Yeah, I love that. I think there's so many ways in which as a society, we can better support those changes without stigmatizing and without othering and without saying this is a deficit, but just acknowledging that this is something that happens to people and how do we better support it so that we all can participate the ways we want. We can build ages different, you know, than other forms of ageism is different from other forms of prejudice. Again, every person's experience is unique, but we can apply what we've learned, which I think is a lot about um, challenging racism in the workplace, challenging gender bias in the workplace. I often think of an experiment that a orchestra in Europe um, performed because they were mostly, wait for it, older white guys, and they wanted to diversify. So they had people um, audition behind a curtain and then they put a carpet underneath it so they couldn't hear people's footfalls. And because it didn't work when they just like wanted to do it, because once we have, so so as a thought experiment, Think about what that curtain and that carpet might be like, especially y'all in HR, because HR is the gatekeepers for this. And there are multiple studies that show that people in HR acknowledge that older workers are every bit as satisfactory as younger ones, and y'all still don't want to hire us. So what is the curtain and the carpet that you could put or or teach yourself or employ that would keep those biases from slotting into place because we're all ageist, we're all racist we're all ableist, we're all biased in ways that we have to become aware of and work against. 
Yes, I loved that story um, about the the orchestra where they put the curtain down and then to just further explain a little bit, they were still hiring a disproportionate amount of men. And when they put the carpet down, they started having better gender equality because uh-huh. they realized it was the high heels clicking on the floor that we were they were subconsciously paying attention to and saying, OK, we can tell, you know, who this person is and it's going to yeah. impact our, our hiring. Bias is unconscious. You know, and a lot of, you know, people say, you know, oh, hello, young lady, you know, well, maybe they meant it as a compliment, but it didn't feel like a compliment, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And, and when we challenge that gently, you know, and a really good, like, all-purpose response to an ageist comment is, what do you mean by that? Yes, and, tell you know, me more. Neutral tone. And, uh-huh. uh, but, you know, some some older women like to be called young lady. That's their truth. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really, it's such an interesting intersection of all of these different isms. And so I'm so glad you dove into that because I think about things like um, there's the, I think it's L'Oreal, one of the hair dye companies has the like keep the gray movement and on its surface, it feels so like, ooh, yes, this is good. This is empowering. And then you look at it and it's nothing but women that are saying, hey, you're a woman. Okay, we guess it's okay for you to be gray now. Um, But they don't have those same type of things aimed at men. And so there's this really Mm -hmm. interesting intersection that happens when you start to really dive into trying to sell you stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I have one last question for you before we jump into the audience question. So audience, remember to type some of your questions in, we'll get to in just a second. But Ashton, I want to jump back and go a little bit higher level from you and tell me more about what your path was that got you here into this uh, fight against ageism. Oh, you didn't prepare me for that one. Um, Well, (laughs) I, I have never, ever uh, had a conventional career. I never imagined being a public speaker. I never dreamt of being a writer. I think writing is really hard and, and not fun. But I write because I have something that seems important. And I got on the path because I decided I couldn't stay in my marriage. And I learned, and again, a fact that's floating at the top of the internet, that two thirds of divorces in the US were initiated by women. And I was astonished. I figured it was like 98% men dumping their sad, used up, you know, wives like me for fertile trophy versions. And I became sort of obsessed with why so few women knew that, why our view of late life was so grim when the reality around us was so manifestly different. And we don't know it because we live in a sexist, ageist patriarchy. And it was very parallel And of course, I ended up drawing on all the things I had learned about structural bias and the way prejudice works and the way capitalism works and patriarchy works when 20 20 years later, 15 years later, I'm like, oh, crap, I'm getting old. Like this is this is happening to me. It's hard to imagine getting old. We age slowly. And I think that's human. You know, I don't think that's bias, but it was the same thing. Why am I so afraid? And I started looking into it, interviewing older people and realized in a matter of months, the, 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 the data points that I started this talk out with, and it was the same thing. Why don't we know this when the fear is so bad for us, yeah. you know, psychologically, socially, and the costs, I didn't even get into the costs for the US economy and the global economy. It's really bad for us and the information is available. So. Um, you know, I get a bee in my bonnet and then um, I'm off on a tear. <laughs> no, that's good. I think that passion is is so clearly obvious within you, but I think it's so valuable, right? I think all of these different myths that we've talked about are just so salient within our culture and our society. And I think something you said at the very beginning really resonated with me. If we have this perception that like younger years are better and we hype, we say things like college is the best years of your life. And I distinctly remember being in college going, Ooh, if this is it, I don't know about the rest of life. (laughs) And I was hearing last night, someone was saying a a younger person that a a friend of hers is in her twenties and she's just like, she's depressed and and her vision is that it's just going to get worse. Because I mean, remember, all sorts of of power structures benefit from us staying stuck in this way of thinking, yeah. just yeah. like they benefit from racial prejudice and gender prejudice. Age bias in the workforce enables employers, and I'm, I'm not saying this to, to piss off the, the, the higher ups at Google, but it enables workers at both ends of the age yeah. spectrum to be taken advantage of, for example. So always zoom out at, you know, who's, who's, there's a great quote from a scholar named Amos Wilson. If you want to understand any problem in America, America, 
Don't look at who suffers from it. Look at who profits from it. Yes, absolutely. I love it. And so in order to do that, we have to recognize and acknowledge and have these types of conversations. And so I'm so thrilled that you're here today. Uh, and let's jump over to the uh, comments from the live audience. Do you have questions? All right, from Joris, what do you suggest for people to prepare for a vibrant life after retirement? Uh, well, I think it is completely individual. You know, a lot of people um, can't afford to retire. A lot of people don't want to retire. Uh, a lot of people love being retired. I continue to work, but I am in control of my work schedule and the jobs that I want to take. I don't have, you know, I, I don't have to go get a job as a greeter at Walmart to pay my rent. So um, I do think, um, I, I do think that I think that American, the American workforce needs more on ramps and on off ramps and on again ramps so that if you want to take some time off to, to have a sabbatical, to take care of someone, to have a baby, to look after a grandchild, that we can transition out and back in again if we want. And so that older people are not, you know, shown the door, but have, you know, kicked out the door, but have time to pass on what we know and to mentor younger people and by speaking of mentorships, like younger people have a lot to teach older people too. It's not a, you know, wise old person. That's another ageist stereotype. Lots of older people don't seem to have learned much along the way. Um, but I digress. So I think it depends on what, what that person's, I, what they can afford and hopefully catalyzing enough social change and economic priority so that older people across the socioeconomic spectrum have the support to um, choose how they wish to retire. Um, you know, I, I imagine that I would just sit in a porch swing and, and read novels all day. It would probably drive me nuts. Um, but uh, think about it, you know, think about it in advance and think about um, what the habits, physical or mental or social conditions are that will help you um, be able to keep doing the things you want to do, versions of them at least, um, for as long as possible. Yeah, I love that. I think that we really emphasize, like you said, paternity or maternity leave. And we think about these kind of concrete stages of people's life, but we stop thinking about those different types of stages as people get older and what are the ways that we can recognize it? Not because maternity or paternity leave, you're just hanging out, taking a break, but how can we figure out how to recognize those different milestones and allow people to ebb and flow within them? That's a great point. I love it. A next question from Joris again. Would it help to popularize a name for a third phrase in life that comes after the work children centered uh, phase to encourage people to be better prepared? Hmm. Uh, thank you for that question, Joris. I'm, I'm going to push back against the idea that there are fixed phases in life. I read today that 10% of kids, young children in America are being raised by their grandchildren. Hmm. So those older people are still in the child centered phase. Uh, I hmm. think, you know, everywhere in the world, people are living longer and we have a bit of, we're still stuck a little bit in this idea of first you, you know, you have childhood and you go to school and then you get married and have children and um, succeed in your career and save enough for retirement. Good luck with that in today's economy. Um, and then you retire. And I think um, for better and for worse, because there's a lot of, can be a lot of stress involved in a society without a lot of social and economic support. Um, you know, we, we, we move in and out, we're going to move in and out of work. People don't have the same job from, from, you know, their whole careers anymore. There's freedom in that and there's vulnerability in that. So anytime you label a period of life as um, you link a stage of life to a chronological age, it's problematic because there are people younger than that who don't do that thing. There are people older than that who do do that thing. And there, and, and people may or may not want to be in that group. So I think it's important to avoid thinking in terms of stages. You know, there are people talk about elderhood, people talk about the third age. The problem with the third age is then you're like all worried about the, it still assumes there's a, four, you know, as a time of, of growth and you're going to do classes and learn and volunteer and give back and maybe start a company, which is fantastic. 
and you may or you may not, you may want to, or you may not not want to, you may have the option or you may not. But then it suggests that there's a fourth, fourth age where everything falls apart and you just, you know, totter around and get sick and die. That could happen. We could get, you know, chronic seriously ill at 20, you know, at, and so on out. They're not linked ever to fixed chronological ages or stages. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I uh, have heard that a lot lately around that concept of if you wait until you're retired, because then all of a sudden you'll have all this money and all this free time and all this, you know, desire to finally do the thing that you care about. Like that's the the route to go and just kind of how wrong that is and how we think about aging and how we think about who we are as people along the aging life cycle is just kind of, you know, a little bit different than we've been thinking about yeah, it for the last just- decades. Your, your uh, term of, you know, aging life cycle. I just want to mention one thing. Yeah, I think we, we tend to think of aging as something sad and, and sort of sorry that old people do. And we are aging from the minute we yes. are born. Aging is living and to live is to age, right? It's, it's yes. how we move through life. It's why this subject, if you had told me, you know, 15 years ago, I'd be fascinated with aging. I would have said, ooh, why do you, I want to think about something <laughs> sort of sad and depressing. And it's anything but it touches on every domain of study and every aspect of being human. It's fascinating. Yeah, awesome. I'm so glad that you shifted your framing from sad and depressing so that- I, I sound like I'm selling something. I'm not, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome though. I love this. I love people who are passionate about this. I think it's such an important topic. And I see that we have a, one more question that popped through from Sasha. What cities or countries do you think are doing an especially good job of being olders friendly and how? Good work on olders. See, it rolls off the tongue. It's much nicer than you're spreading older it. Old friendly. Olders and youngers. Make it Google. Take it, <laughs> take it on. Um, you know, they're the probably the best example is Singapore because it's tiny, it's homogenous, and it's rich. Um, there are different uh, so you know p- population aging um is happening everywhere the forces that are driving age segregation are industrialization, urbanization. So everywhere you have people, um, you know, for example, older people being left in the countryside as younger people move to cities for jobs that fosters isolation, discrimination, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 all the things I've already said. So, but within any country, you can find communities that are age integrated from which we can learn. There's all kinds of interesting experiments happening now of students, um, college students living in um, senior residences on condition that they like talk to the old people every so often on intergenerational initiatives for, for dinners and, and work and mentoring opportunities. So I think it's less, I mean, I think according to the, um, the help age index, I think Afghanistan has the worst quality of life for mm. older people and Switzerland, the youngest, the, the best, but that's more because of overall um, economic conditions and I'm Got sure it. healthcare and war um, rather than any attribute of the country or, or the um, culture. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Ashton, this has been absolutely delightful. I've loved hearing your perspective. I think this is such an important topic that we need to figure out. How do we combat ageism? It's so valuable. Like we said, not only for older adults, but also for everybody if we start to shift our mindset and our framing around this. And so thank you so much for joining us. I know I can see so many comments in the thread right now saying how much they absolutely adore not only you, but your hat collection in the back um, <laughs> that I think we all have enjoyed seeing as well. But thank you so much for joining us at Toxic at Google. I your wear those hats. I, good. I'm glad. Uh, your perspective was really insightful, though. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone in the audience for watching and we'll see you next time at Toxic Google.